So, good morning, everybody. And welcome to uh, the second day of our conference. And before we start, can I please ask you all to mute your mobiles? So, my name is uh, Mette Skarn Møyretsen, and I'm the chair of the Integrated uh, Ecosystem Assessment Steering Group here in ISIS. And I have uh, the pleasure of uh, introducing our keynote speaker of today, uh, Professor Manuel Bravange, who we also met yesterday in uh, the opening session on uh, ocean sustainability. Manuel Barange is uh, the Director of Fisheries and Aquaculture Policy and Resource Division in the Food and Agriculture Organization um, of the United Nations FAO. He is also an honorary professor at the Exeter University UK and have had leading positions at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory also in the UK. He was the chair of the ISIS Science Committee in uh, the period 2010 to 2013 and key to the last ISIS strategic plan that we used until last year, 2018. And this uh, strategy plan was, uh, in my opinion, a very brave strategy. It really put uh, ecosystem science and ecosystem approach to management in the front here in ISIS. That strategy made a difference both in ISIS and outside, and also for my career as an ecosystem scientist. Manuel Barange is strongly involved in assessing the role of climate change on fish, ecosystems, fisheries, policies, food security, and livelihoods. He was the editor of the impressive 2018 FAO report, uh, Impacts of Climate Change on Fisheries and Aquaculture, Synthesis of Current Knowledge, Adaptation, and Mitigation Options. He is a review editor of the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate that will be launched later in September this year. He is a contributing author to the ongoing sixth assessment report for the IPCC. And he is also an active scientist in the fisheries and marine ecosystem model intercomparison project with FishMIP, using global ecosystem models to assess impacts of climate change. Today, Manuel Barange will tell us about the future of fish and its role in securing food for a nine billion world. Please, Manuel. Thank you very much, Mete. It was a very kind introduction. It's a bit humbling to hear. Um, I want to talk to you today about the future of fish and its role in securing food for a nine billion world. Let me start by learning how to click this. <laughs> there you are. What does the ocean mean to you? Look at these pictures carefully and imagine that you draw a Venn diagram with the points of the Venn diagram, each one of these figures, pictures. And each one of us will have a different Venn diagram. A diagram that reflects your values, your hopes, and your aspirations for the ocean. William James once said that our view of the world is truly shaped by what and whom we decide to hear. And for that reason, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. It's my second time as a keynote uh, speaker in ISIS, an organization that I, I love and I think that is a model to, to many. I work for the FAO, an organization that is fairly large. This is the headquarters in central Rome. Many of you would have been there. Staff of almost 13,000 people, a budget of $1.4 billion. The majority of it, as you see in orange in those pies, are delivered in the field, so not in the headquarters, in the five regional offices, 11 sub-regional offices, and 132 national offices that we have around the world. Obviously, most, all of them in regions that require support. The FAO was created in 1945 for one reason only, and that was that at that time, expert opinion was that we couldn't feed the world of three billion people. 
That was the only reason. How are we going to feed a world of three billion people? That was in 1945. Three billion people was reached uh, in 1960. I was born in 1961. And now we wonder how we're going to feed a world of nine to 10 billion people. So the question hasn't changed. It's just the scale that has changed. And I think that is one of the organizations that I feel more proud to have served. The Department uh, of Fisheries and Aquaculture deals with every aspect of fisheries, from collecting statistics and information and anal analyzing it, uh, developing policy, supporting institutions, uh, supporting uh, fisheries management, economics and trade of fisheries, products and industry, development of technologies, emergencies and rehabilitation, rehabilitation in places where that is needed, and also, of course, sustainability and conservation issues. The vision of the department is very simple, is to make sure that we have a world in which sustainable use of fisheries and aquaculture makes an appreciable contribution to human well-being, food security, and poverty alleviation. And we do that in these three pictures. By the way, all the pictures you'll see are from, uh, taken from FAO staff in the field, um, either from work on the Bridge of Nansen program, the only vessel that carries a UN flag, which we uh, run it's run by Norway, but we run the program serving waters uh, throughout Africa and in the Indian Ocean at the moment. Uh, from work in the field, like in the middle, teaching how to develop aquaculture in communities that need food and need business. Or on the right, uh, how to train uh, people to reduce loss and waste by training people that have never been trained before on how to make sure that fish doesn't go to waste. This was an introduction. The contents of the, this is the contents of this talk that I will give you. Just talk a little bit about production trends in fish. Talk about the legitimate conundrum of to conserve or to use. Uh, the, the facts on ecological sustainability of fisheries, trends and fish consumption, who is fish food for, and then looking into the future, where will the food come from? Uh, touch on supply demand expectations, and then finish with the road to Calvary, what do we need to do to get to where we want to go? And some parting shots, because I can. This is uh, a brief story, history of fish production in one slide. Many of you have seen it. FAO produces this every year with an update on extra year. You have in dark blue uh, capture fishery, marine capture fisheries, in light blue inland fisheries, in yellow uh, marine aquaculture and in green inland aquaculture. And I've just put on top of there some of the most important elements of policy, international policy in, rela in rega relation to fisheries. Now the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, you know, the Bible of ocean management, was only agreed in fact in 1982 and came into force in 1994. So this is actually a very new field when it comes to international regulation. Uh, 1995, we had the FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries, and the UN Fish Stocks Agreement uh, also agreed in 1995. Now, this slide provides some of the basics for the narrative for fisheries in the world, which I summarized in the, on the left. Fish production has outpaced population growth over this period. Aquaculture has become the fastest growing food production industry in the world in percentage times. Uh, percentage terms for the last five decades. We now provide fish, 20.3 uh, 20, kilograms of fish per person per year. 10% of the world population, it's estimated to rely completely on fish and fisheries for their livelihoods. And very important, often mis uh, forgotten, the net export income for developing countries from exporting fish is larger than that income from all other food commodities put together all of them. So fish is an important uh, source of income as well. Now this figure often uh, is discussed as to whether the fish capture is stable or not. So if you look at the blue, you know, whether it is stable or it declines or it increases, we don't really uh, analyze very much what that trend means. But this uh, sort of constancy or stability, in fact, from 1994-95 is in the midst of an extremely dynamic country by country and species by species um, production. I'm just going to show you in the next slide, you're going to see, in fact, a movie with uh, it's a bar chart, and you'll have the top 10 country producers of fish, 
from 1970 to the present, and you see the sh the how quickly it changes. <coughs> so we start 1970 with Peru and Japan, the top producers. Japan wins in 1972. The Soviet Union closing to Japan and continues very close to it. Peru and Chile, you'll see going up and down, depending on the production of Peruvian anchoveta. <coughs> Look at China. It's only one, two, three, four, five, six. Number six in the world in 1983. At that point, China, 80% of China was below poverty line. In 1988, the Soviet Union disappears, Russia appears, China starts growing. Look, it's now number four, Peru going up and down, China becomes number three, then number two, and then in 1995, it becomes a top producer. From then on, China continues to the right and everyone else declines. But below that, lots of dynamism, Norway only number nine, India, Russia, Indonesia, Japan, United States, number three. And as we approach the present time, there's going to be a bit of stability. Indonesia is going to grow to number three. And then when Peru, Anchoveta declines, not yet, there you are. <coughs> well, there you are. <laughs> That's the dynamism. And if you think about that in species terms, you also can see the same dynamism. It's not as stable. It's as stable at the global level. It's very dynamic at the national level. Currently, China producing twice as much as number two in the world. And aquaculture, well, I had to remove China from here. Let me just go back. Stop it. We had to remove China from this chart because China produces 60% of global aquaculture. So if I put in this figure, then you'll see nothing else. So um, there you are. Let's see if I can. There you are. Starts in 1970. Japan, the United States, Spain, France are the top producers. Isn't that amazing? It's the developed world that we're leading. And then over time, you can see Korea appearing, Indonesia. You see a lot of fluctuation near the bottom. Uh, India growing very rapidly, as well as Korea. Spain and France declining in volume. Look, you don't even see Norway. This is aquaculture. Eh? India overtaking Japan in 1987. <coughs> this continues to move, very dynamic. Korea, Philippines, Indonesia, Japan continues to decline, and you'll see that it's been going to be overtaking soon. Vietnam, just look at Vietnam. Very important, Vietnam and Indonesia, their patterns. This is 1998. Uh, Indonesia is number three and starts to grow. Now number two, Vietnam is climbing up. Now one, two, three, four, five, six. Then becomes number four, then number three, then number two. Then disease uh, issues in Vietnam force it to decline a little bit, the production. Indonesia catches up. Egypt, look, Egypt is creeping up. Norway is now grown to number five in the world. And now the battle between Inde, India, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Indonesia almost overtaking India as the top number two producer in 2017. So again, very dynamic. And the important thing in aquaculture is you can see many emerging economies. Look, look at the list. Indonesia, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Egypt, Norway, then not a developing world. <laughs> Myanmar, Thailand, Philippines. This is really the, the demonstration of how Asia really developed its economies on the basis of aquaculture. Now, one almost brackets here. What is behind fish production graphs? All these graphs that you've seen so now. It's thousands of officers and scientists work all over the world. Uh, the data is primarily given by member countries. This is their obligation for data collection and data submission to FAO. We complement or replace the data with other validated sources, only validated sources, including regional fisheries management organizations, as per standards of the CWP, which is a committee of the working party on fisheries statistics. Nothing goes into these data sets unless it has been validated and it is cleared. FAO also provides estimates in case of no reporting for a particular country. And we work with countries never in the public domain, always uh, in private conversations to revise the data when we feel that it is, this is appropriate. And we do that all the time. No one will know except the country itself. But we can say, for example, this, la this last year we revised the fishery catches of China since 2009 to 2017 at the request of China and this, because it had a significant impact on the time series, was uh, announced and was released, and there's a press release about it on the FAO site. There's about 230 countries and territories that send submissions of data to FAO, and about two-thirds of them uh, uh, update 
the, the, the data every year. Um, and some, some do not, and they do it every two years, and, and therefore in between FAO does the estimation. Now we feel the statistics are becoming better and better all the time, and one of the indicators to know that is that now in 2017 we have 2,144 species in the capture fisheries database and 608 species in the aquaculture database, which 70% 70, 70 more detail than in 2000, which means that countries are now uh, identifying their species better and they're providing better statistics to us. Um, there's been a lot of work, in fact, in the, in, 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 in the academic world on topping up the FAO statistics with other estimates of illegal activity, of discards, um, fine, everyone can do that. However, there's only one way to improve statistics, and it's not employing a postdoc to revise a time series. It is by building capacity, human capacity, institutional capacity, country by country, setting standards, providing tools. It is a painful and long piece of work and doesn't reach success very quickly, but it is the only way. And it's for this reason that FAO has a, a large capacity building program, as you can see in some of the dots here. <laughs> now, that's me in the middle. <coughs> um, we, we often find ourselves in, in this conundrum between, between use and conserve. Uh, the world, or the part of the world that have ecological sustainability concerns, as you can see in some of the headlines, my my favorite in inverted commas, stop eating fish, it's the only way to save life in our seas. Uh, I've written many stupid things in life, but not many as stupid as this one. <laughs> but there's a reason why they say that, I will get to that. On the left is the food and nutrition security expectations, with lots of demand for eating more fish, and how good fish is to eat, and so and so. I'm going to discuss the right hand, and then I'm going to discuss the left hand for you. Everyone has an opinion on fisher sustainability, isn't it? It's like football. Everyone has an opinion, well, football only meant, but <laughs> well, not, not, not any longer. Sorry, I'm going to be accused. <laughs> um, everyone has an opinion on fisher sustainability, and some are based on facts. Now, this is a figure that is not from me, it's from Chris Costello. Um, every dot is a fish stock, um, and it's placed in these two axes. The, the x-axis is the biomass of the stock, reference to the biomass that produces maximum sustainable yield. So number one is when the stock is at the level that produces maximum. And on the y-axis is the fishing mortality, whether the fishing mortality is higher or uh, lower than the fishing mortality that leads to maximum sustainable yield. So the ideal place to be really is the central point here. And what you can see in here is that you have four quarters. Quarter one is the stocks that are on target, the biomass is large, the fishing mortality is low. Then you have the quadrant where there's active overfishing, the fishing mortality is high and the biomass is low. And in between you have two uh, quadrants, that one is on the left when there's overfished in the past, uh, the biomass is low but the fishing mortality is also low. And then the one that is unstable because if you have large biomass and large fishing mortality at some point that stock is going to move. Now what is this telling you? It tells you that every fish stock has a story. And that's what the picture on the left really is trying to show. Every fish stock has a story. And to have generic statements about fish sustainability, whether we are failing or whether we are succeeding, is missing the point. It's missing the point. We have thousands of fish stocks and w that we manage and some that we don't manage, and they're doing different, following different trajectories. Now, FAO from 1974, uh, computes an index of sustainability, which is biomass-based, that ca classifies uh, stocks into three categories. Those stocks that are underfished, those are the, the blue in that figure, where the biomass is above 1.2 of the biomass that produces maximum sustainable yield. What we call maximally sustainably fished is a mouthful, but you don't know how long it took to reach that, you know, to, to arrive at, at, a, at a title. That is where the biomass is between 0.8 and 1.2 of maximum sustainable yield. And then the overfish stocks, which is where the biomass is below 0 0.8 um, MSY. This is applied to about 450 species worldwide, the same ones in 1974. 
that uh, cover about 70% of uh, the global total landings. And we do this analysis every two years. And remember that in all the international agreements, and I mentioned at the bottom the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal 14.4, they talk about restoring fish stocks to levels that can produce maximum sustainable yield. That means the green. Now, where are we on this? So this is the time series, uh, simplified. Now, in red is the non-sustainable fisheries, the ones that are being overexploited or are being overexploited. In green, the maximum sustainably fished, the ones that are we, we are fishing at the level that they should be fished, and in blue, the underfished. So you can look at this figure and you can read it in two ways, horizontally or vertically. If you read it vertically, the conclusion is that despite claims of global mismanagement, the global fishery is still on average managed as expected by the law of the sea. The majority of the stocks are fished according to maximum sustainable yield principles. That is not normally acknowledged. But if you look at it horizontally, then you see a trend. And that trend is that there's a dangerous deterioration over time of the over number of uh, percentage of overfished stocks from 10% in 1974 to 33% now. So based on this, unless that trend changes, we will not achieve the Sustainable Development Goal 14.4. Now, there's a, we do this assessment as well by regions, by big regions. We never point fingers or blame countries. We do it by big regions. And you can he see here in this complex figure, two numbers for each region, uh, the percentage that is sustainable and the percentage that, that are unsustainable in green and red and below the percentage of the total catch that comes from that region. And it's not surprising to know that the places where sustainability is worse, whereas the Mediterranean, uh, the, the west coast of Africa, both sides of the uh, um, South American continent, in general, this is a reflection of the very unequal capacity of states to manage their resources. It's very easy to blame countries for not re managing the resources properly. But, you know, no country is the same and we have different capacity throughout. It also shows something that we say uh, often, the places where fishery sustainability is worse is where there's political conflict, when there's hunger, and when there's poverty. It's obvious, isn't it? But how often we forget. There's un one important element that worries us a lot in FAO, and that is a di differential trend that we see between developed and developing regions. And there's a there's a health warning in there. The UN does not classify countries by developed or developing, except for statistical purposes. There's no uh, sort of narrative associated with it. It's purely for statistical purposes. But what you can see is that over time, in the developed world, this is, these are the blue lines, from the mid-80s, the landings declined and then slightly stabilized, and in fact has gone up a little bit in, in, in recent years. And the effort has been declining as well over time since 1990. In the developing world, we see the opposite trend. Catches have increased uh, slow, more slowly now, but the effort continues to increase. So this is completely uh, it's a, a, a seesaw situation of completely different trends between developing and developed world. And it's interesting that it is in the developed world where the effort has declined and the land is unstabilized that the narrative of overfishing comes from. And in the developing world, where things are really in dire straits and uh, overfishing is becoming more problematic, there is no discussion of overfishing there. It's th the conversation is about food security. <sighs> Let's move to the left. Now you have an idea of what, how good or ho how bad fishery sustainability is from an ecological perspective. On the left, the pressure to eat more fish. Now, this figure, uh, it's, it's a simplification, but this is the annual growth rate on, of three parameters. Population of the in the world, um, animal proteins, uh, the growth in consumption of animal proteins, and the growth in consumption of fish proteins. What you see is that from 1961 to 2013, population growth has been at about 1.5 per year. That's the population growth globally. The Consumption of animal proteins has grown at about 2.5%. And the consumption of fish in, as part of the diet has grown by 3%. So that means that fish consumption has grown twice the rate of population. What this shows is what we call in the UN system nutrition transition. 
as countries develop, become economically more viable and a bit more affluent, they improve their diet, and diet improvement means eating more protein. But every continent and every region has a different trend. Um, what you have here, um, the time series in per capita fish consumption for different continents, but I've also included the USSR because it's a very interesting case. You see the USSR is the brown there. You can see the incre incredible consumption, growth in consumption, fish consumption per capita, up to 30 kilograms per person per year until a complete decline, until the collapse of the Soviet Union. You can see history in the making, isn't it? Well, you can see here a couple of interesting points. Uh, in orange, you have Asia. You can see uh, black, by the way, is the global average, right? So on average, globally, we were eating 9, 9.5 kilograms per person per year in 1961. We now consume 20.3 kilograms per person per year. So we've doubled the per capita consumption over time. In orange is Asia. So you can see that uh, it was below the global average until 1994 and then overtook the global average and has been growing very fast. Interestingly, it's been growing very fast, but as a percentage of the total animal consumed, fish in Asia has declined. So that growth in fish consumption is also matched with a, an even faster grow in consumption of chicken and beef and, and, and pork. That's the development uh, also in Asia. A Couple of issues to worry about. First, Oceania in blue is the biggest cons consumer of fish per capita and is the area where fish is needed most. Very high dependency on fish. And then look at Africa and Latin America, fairly low. Yes, you can say that, okay, it's double, they have doubled the consumption from five kilograms per person per year in 1961 to 10 kilograms now. So it's the same rate of growth as other regions, but nevertheless, in Africa in particular, this is the, this blue line here, they are consuming as much fish as the whole world was consuming in 1960, on average. And that's the place where uh, fish is gonna be needed most. Mm, parenthesis here. Uh, the population of the world currently, if we were to um, simplify it, we have roughly one billion people living in Europe, one billion in Americas, one billion in Africa, and four billion in Asia. By 2100, we will still have around 1 billion in Europe and 1 billion in the Americas, but we'll have 4 billion in Africa and 5 billion in Asia. So Africa will mu multiply its population by a factor of 4 by the year 2100. Unless fish production increases, Africa will be the only continent that will see a decline in per capita fish consumption by 2100. Now, fish is crucial for nutrition, and it's especially the case in, in, in poorer regions. This figure, what you have is this uh, protein intake of fish and seafood in, in grams per capita. And this is how much of it, how much of the animal in the diet comes from fish. Uh, so if a country is towards moving towards the right, the right means that they are eating more fish. If it's moving up, it means that fish is more important in the diet than any other animal protein. And we see this line, this is the world, this circle here is the average of the world. So if you look at this line that I've drawn, on the right are what, Europe, North America, where there's very high consumption of fish, but it's a very low part of the diet. So it's very easy to say, I give up fish, fine, you know. <laughs> Above the line, you see the countries that there's still a very high consumption of fish as well, but a very large proportion of the animal diet comes from fish. Sierra Leone, Cambodia, Maldives, up to 70% of the animal protein comes from fish. Now, to say I give up fish in those regions is not that easy. Right? So there was a game changer that took place in 2014 when the UN Committee for, uh, on World Food Security requested a special report uh, to study the role of sustainable fisheries and aquaculture for food security and nutrition. And this report concluded four things. First, that fish is a critical food source. Second, that it deserves a central position in food security and nutrition strategies, which is generally not the case even now. Third, that food security and nutrition should be considered in fish trade policies. And fourth, that any future increase in demand will likely have to come from aquaculture because fisheries 
as reaching, as reaching its, its maximum. And there's also this concept that developed over time of fish as nature's superfood because it's much more than volume, it's much more than protein. It is the micronutrients and the contribution of micronutrients to nutrition security, particularly in the areas where, where uh, food is limiting, is significant, very significant. So this has become really the mantra, nature's superfood. Fish is not just protein, it's micronutrients. Yeah, okay, but then what about the future? Now, at the moment, we've, I've been looking back, you know, and then we'll just uh, turn around and start looking forward. What are the expectations uh, for the future? Well, first, let's be clear, because I work for the United Nations FAO, and I've told you what we stand for. The first objective, the first base, is to make poverty history, because it's very difficult to solve the fisheries problems with poverty above us. Now, we have made enormous progress in poverty, uh, in the fight against poverty over time. I've shown you here the, a graph since 1910. Would you believe that in 1990, there were almost two billion people uh, that were considered in extreme poverty, poverty in the world, almost two billion people. There's now about 730 million. It's a very significant number. It's an insult to our intelligence, but nevertheless, there's been a significant decline. It's about 10% of the world's population that are uh, living in poverty. Of course, if you are in the 90%, you think that's very good. But if you are in the 10%, you think this is terrible. But we are progressing. The second base is making hunger history, and there we are not making such great progress. We did make a lot of progress in the past, but I've just shown here the, since 2000. And when you can see the lines bending upwards in recent years. Um, so in Africa, for example, uh, here, going up, least developed countries going up. Uh, you can see here Latin America. Latin America and Oceania is the right axis in millions for, for obvious reasons. The rest are on the left. But the majority of them in the developing world turning in the wrong direction around 2014, 2015. And the FAO has concluded that there are two reasons for that, three reasons for that. First, climate shocks, not just climate change, but climate, climate shocks, political conflict, is the second one, and inequality. And we need to fight those two things, making sure that we make best and sustainable use of resources. There are two contrasting pictures in here. The only thing that I want to say about this picture is that food does not come out of magicians' hats. All food systems have impacts. There is no such thing as food production that does not cause impacts. And somehow, we seem to have a much more prepared mind to accept impacts on land. The figure on the right consists on destroying every bit of biodiversity in that land in order to produce a single crop uh, than we have on the left uh, on the oceans. And we have to balance our views on this because the question is, where is the food coming from? And I need to speed up. 10% um, of the world's land is used for agriculture. Another 10% is habitable land that is not used for agriculture and 70% is oceans. Where does the growth coming from? Uh, if we have to increase agricultural land, more than 10% of the, of the world, then we have to impinge into forests or, 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 or human habitation. So oceans have become the mantra, we need to produce more food from the oceans, as this report from the European Commission showed. And the diet analysis and trends tell us that we will be eating more fish. This is a, a a paper from uh, Willett et al., the famous EAT report, that shows, in fact, that pr compared to a healthy reference, we are consuming less fish than we should in all regions. And so the FAO estimations is that we're going to be growing our consumption of fish. Uh, we have it here up to 2028, and you can see the growth that we expect, in fact, from 2015, 2020, 2025, 2028. So we expect to eat more fish per capita, and we are encouraged to do so. Um, so let's play with numbers a little bit. These are some estimations of fish supply. Uh, the 2017 FAO are actually the, the real values, of course. We have estimated for 2028, and we've also extrapolated to 2050. And so we look at 2050, we expect about you know, 94, 95 million tons of fish captured about 130 million tons in aquaculture, with a total of 225. 
I remove about 20% of the capture because it might be used for non-food purposes, although this percentage is declining every year, and that gives about 207 or so of, uh, for food. The World Resources Institute does similar estimations, and they came up with this sort of figure, although I have reduced their figure because they did not remove any, uh, any capture fisheries that are may not be used for food. So l let's talk about 210 or so, 210 to 120 million tons of fish that may be produced by 2050. The fish demand, uh, this comes from uh, Max Troll's pa recent paper. Um, if we, business as usual, means we continue co to consume fish at the same rate as we do now, and we continue wasting fish in the way that we do, because about 30% of fish is wasted uh, at different stages of the, uh, of the food chain. Um, we will be requiring about 220 million tons of fish. If we eat according to the healthy references of the dietitians, which means that we need to increase our fish consumption, and we half the waste the, of fish, we need about 237 million. And if we have a healthy reference, but we continue wasting what we waste, then we need about 320 million. So you can see the shortfall in, in yellow there. By the way, the estimates of shortfall differ from the ones from Max Troll. Um, because he did not take into consideration um, the percentage of fish that is not used for food. There's a health warning on all these numbers, which is, you know, they're back of the envelope numbers in some respects, but it shows that there is a shortfall of fish production by 2050. How do we match this? At some point, something has to change. Um, if fish is to continue contributing and growing its contribution to food and, and nutrition security, w something has to change. And I'm going to tell you, perhaps a bit technical, but a list of things in capture fisheries and aquaculture that I think need to change. First, in capture fisheries, the issue is one of sustainability. It's a sustainability challenge. Technically speaking, fishery sustainability is a solved problem. If we have the money and if we have the political will, we know how to make fishing sustainable. And the European region in the Northeast Atlantic in particular is an example of that. The U.S. is an example of that. 90% of fish stocks in the U.S. are not uh, overfished now. In Australia, it's 80.3. In the European Union, Northeast Atlantic region is uh, 59%. Political will is what is key to success. And something that I mentioned yesterday, disinvestment in fishing sustainability is making things worse. No one wants to fund fishing sustainability projects. Even the World Bank disinvested in fisheries about 20 years ago. They are now saying that they might actually come back to it. We need also to start considering the social dimension of sustainability. We cannot be all the time demonizing a community that is extremely poor. There are very few rich fishermen. There are some, but in, in percentage, very few. Remember, 85% of fishers live in Asia and 10% live in, in Africa. So 95% of all fishers live in A Asia and Africa. We need to reduce loss and waste, both at sea and on land, eradicate negative subsidies that make fisheries sustainable when they might not be without subsidies, bearing in mind that every production industry, by the way, has subsidies, but we need to stop it in fisheries too, and that link to stopping illegal fishing. Adapt to climate change, and, uh, and we will have uh, tomorrow a pr presentation from Greta Peckle, which I'm sure will be great precisely on this. And we need to expand the food basket, eat more what is there rather than what we would like it to be there. And finally, remember as well that fisheries cannot be seen in isolation. It is part of and subject to other non-fisheries impacts. The political economy in countries is as important as fisheries management, especially nowadays. We need a new narrative for what fisheries is for. And it is for this reason that uh, we decided to organize an international symposium on fishing sustainability in November this year to develop a new vision for fisheries in the 21st century. What do we want from fisheries? Are we happy with it being a produ producer of food? Do we want to conserve and close the oceans for divers and you know, the drinking mojitos on the beach? What is it that we want fisheries for? On aquaculture, aquaculture is not a luxury, but a necessity. In this map, what you have is uh, the, the country's production of aquaculture. The darker the color, the higher the production. So what you can see there is Africa, almost white everywhere. Remember what I told you, that Africa will have 4 billion people living in it by, twi by uh, 2100. 
As a global industry, aquaculture is a very young industry and it has to go through the growing periods of any new industry. It is a contributor, but not a replacement for capture fisheries. It is not. It is a contributor. And there are lots of things that need to be done if we want aquaculture to double production by uh, 2050. We need to address policy and legal frameworks, issues of land allocation and ownership, which in many cases are very problematic, including in Africa, capacity building and extension services, provide incentives and financial needs, uh, start selecting genetically strains and species that we can culture best, develop the market chain, the supply and market chain, remove obstacles to trade, uh, make sure that we control disease, that's a very important problem in any animal husbandry industry, and also address public opinion and perceptions. It is sometimes ridiculous to, to, to hear how people have this reaction against aquaculture as if it wasn't a proper fish, but they tuck into ham, you know, next door. <coughs> um, I'm pleased to see the F say that FAO is developing now some guidelines for aquaculture sustainability, what constitutes a sustainable aquaculture growth, and it will be released probably in, in the next year. And then, this is my last slide, there's a final message that I want you to perhaps remember. Um, first, please beware of Western-dominated narratives. I look around the room and it's not the usual room that I normally see, because I travel uh, a lot in Africa and Asia. We must not hide behind conservation objectives and in so doing, vacating the sustainability space. We cannot. Politicians might be comfortable hiding behind basic conservation goals, but that's not going to solve the sustainability problems. The need to check our privileges, removing fishing boats from the landscape cannot be more important than securing high quality, affordable food and livelihoods for many in the poorest sections of community. Get a toolbox and not a hammer. Sustainability failures are governance failures, but the reasons that challenge sustainability are complex, they are region specific, they are multidimensional. Beware of simple solutions. For every complex problem, there's a simple solution that is wrong. If hunger, poverty, and conflict continues, we can all forget about all the global progresses around sustainability. If hunger, poverty, and conflict continues, we can all forget about all the global progresses such as resource sustainability. And finally, it is worth it. Just imagine what a world of nine billion poverty-free, well-educated, well-nourished inhabitants can achieve is worth it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel, for bringing us these uh, global and future perspectives. <coughs> There's a lot here to to reflect on and to, uh, to discuss. We have some time for, um, for um, uh, questions from the audience. Yes, please. Do we have some uh, microphones? Yeah, I'm Ken Andersen from the Technical University of Denmark. Um, so you come from FAO and the perspective is naturally food security and you talk about increasing the basket. Now one way of increasing the basket of fish food is actively removing the largest fish species because they eat the smaller ones which are the more productive. You actually increase the productivity of the ocean in this way. And as an extreme example, I mean it has been estimated that the global population of sperm whales eat on the order of 90 million tons of squid per year, things which could grow for human consumption. What is the perspective of the FAO on such activities? Well, um, <laughs> the FAO has to be very careful about what perspectives because what you're referring to really is the, the, the political imperative and the political messages when it comes to fisheries and fisheries management. In the West in general, fisheries is managed for conservation purposes. We have single species management 
and the objective is to maintain those species at a certain health level. So it's a conservation-driven process. There are a lot of species that are not given quotas, you know, and we don't seem to care so much, but it is conservation-driven. In the East, actually, is the opposite. Uh, in China, the, the, the objective is to produce, and you, you catch what is there, not what you would like. Um, so these are two different perspectives. Now, there have been many uh, discussions, and as you know, about you know, balanced harvesting and to just different ways of exploiting the ocean. Should we give a quota just for uh, days at sea and let people to catch whatever they can and use that as a, as a, as a, as a limit? Should we encourage this conservation-oriented or management? Should we just force... Um, as you were suggesting, you remove the big species so you have a bigger biomass in the ocean for the lower species. Those are political uh, objectives that need to be determined politically. And so from that perspective, FAO has no view. It's the countries that need to decide. But it is very obvious that it goes back to that first slide, what does the ocean mean to you? And that determines what that political message means, and therefore the objectives and the management objectives are. Yeah, there is a question up there. Uh, um, Alexander Kipkin from the Fisheries Department, Port and Tavern. Uh, Manuel, thank you so much for your nice talk. Um, um, my only uh, sort of concern is that, uh, of course, I mean, in the FAO and, uh, I mean, your particular department is doing so much, actually, to try to feed in the, in the future 9 bi billion people. But why, uh, actually, you're not sending a message to uh, UN or to someone else Guys, I mean, maybe we need some other policies not to try to achieve that 9 billion people in the first instance, you know, to feed, because uh, there is not much resources left even in the, in the ocean for that. I mean, I, 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 I definitely saw that in your presentation that 200 uh, million tons is probably, you know, the maximum level of what you can achieve in the ocean. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Um, one important thing in the UN system, and in fact in life, is to make sure where your space is, and to make sure that you keep to your space. My space is to ensure that fisheries are sustainable and makes a contribution to human well-being. How many humans and what humans, that's not my business. And I will stay very clear from suggesting in any way that population should be part of this question. It's part of another question, and it's not my question. Thank you, Manuel and Jacob Granit. Uh, great presentation. We discussed also yesterday the role of fish in the ecosystem. So if the ecosystem uh, doesn't produce, doesn't sort of deliver the food security goals that you have just presented, what then? I, I, saw I missed that aspect of ecosystem management in terms of producing fish. I think we are trying, at least in Europe now, to combine productivity of fish, MSI uh, y levels, but also trying to maintain the ecosystem productivity for much more than fish production, for other services, which could be tourism or other industrial purposes, or the blue economy as a whole. So where does that perspective fit into your presentation? Thank you. <coughs> well, it doesn't fit in the presentation because it's, it's, a, different it's a different question. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, uh, the ocean will continue to produce as long as it, the earth turns and the sun shines. That is for sure. Um, but what is the level of production and whether there's declines or, or increases? I mean, those around here involved in the IPCC know that there's lots of debates. You know, is primary production increasing, decreasing? It looks like in, in by, by 2100 there's a decrease, but it's a small decrease. It's about 3 to 7% decrease in primary production. Those are numbers that are perhaps a bit in the noise level. Um, the issue of maintaining productivity in the ocean is a complex one. What, what does one, one actually mean by that? In our, in our projections, FAO is actually very conservative. When we say that capture fisheries remains more or less the same, 
now to 2050 is actually a very conservative estimate. It's saying, for example, that we maintain the same level of food loss and waste rather than improving the, 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 the use of what we have. It's very difficult to predict into the future and particularly what to do when with this question of protecting what uh, Vladimir Ryabini was saying yesterday, you know, the health of the oceans. What does that mean when you turn that into political objectives and to specific indicators? It's very difficult. But the FAO has a very big program called the Blue Growth Initiative, which uh, is implemented m mostly in Africa, in the Caribbean, and in Southeast Asia, where we work with communities in developing the, the policy framework that, is, uh, that links fisheries um, objectives with other objectives of coastal zone use, and that links them with private in industry so that they provide the investment required to, to uh, generate alternative livelihoods for communities that depend on the coast. So the idea of that is that eventually the, the, the communities that depend on fish have more uh, diversity in their income and therefore less dependency so that they can manage the fluctuations in resource in a way that does not turn them into uh, in a poorer state than they are now. So this is part of another part of FAO, which is this, this blue growth, because we have to grow and as I say yesterday, if, if we just conserve, the ocean is not part of the solution. Uh, so growth is important too. Yes, uh, my name is Sebastian Linke. I'm actually coming from this town, University of Gothenburg. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting and inspiring talk. Um, yesterday, I think you said a very interesting and wise sentence. You said, numbers are not enough to understand the world, but without numbers, we cannot understand the world. And as we all do here, also in your talk, you adhered mostly to the latter part of that sentence. So I wanted to ask you about the first part of this talk, how we can sort of deal with the unmeasurable. Is there any discussion or can you reflect a little bit about the state of the qualitative research in the discussing the state of global fisheries and, 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 and everything connected to that is that you discussed here. I know there are some people working in, in FAO with small scale fisheries, for example, as Rosie Riemann did and, and, and uh, people that produced these small scale fisheries guidelines in 2014 that sort of do more qualitative or, or research about social aspects of fisheries and poverty eradication. So I wanted to ask you if you could just reflect a bit on that, how a, the huge body of knowledge from development studies, for example, that is not only qu quantitative. How do you uh, reflect on making use of that kind of knowledge? Thank you. Yes, uh, it, this is a very good point. Um, I love numbers. I get lost in numbers very quickly. Um, but the world doesn't run on numbers. It runs on people. Uh, and you mentioned about the small-scale fisheries. So in 2014, FAO produced these guidelines, which were agreed by all countries, by the way, guidelines on small-scale fisheries or s sustaining small-scale fisheries for food security and poverty alleviation. That's the full title. And uh, we currently have a very large program called the Hidden Harvest, which is a, a program of estimating in quantitative but also qualitative terms what is the contribution of small-scale fisheries to humanity. And this is beyond food security and it's beyond livelihoods. It's actually about fisheries being the gel that unites communities. Many communities, and that's not news to many of you, and those of you in Canada will immediately resonate with the fact if I say that fisheries sometimes is the gel of a community. And if you remove fisheries, you destroy that community. And so the Small Scale Fisheries Initiative, the Hidden Harvest, is trying to build on that. And this is a big change in, the, in FAO because the FAO of the 1970s and 1980s was much more focused on production. That was the message from the countries. Tell me wha how much we are producing and how much we can increase production. Now the narrative is changing. It's not just about production. It's actually about sustaining production. And it's about sustainability on the three legs of sustainability stool. It's not just ecological sustainability, it's not just economic sustainability, but it is social sustainability. And we are developing social sustainability guidelines, actually, as we speak in the FAO. What constitutes a sustainable uh, fisheries? And it's not just fisheries uh, on in, in the water, but uh, sustainable uh, social fisheries across the value chain. 
and, and that will, be, will come out possibly in the next year again. Uh, it takes a long time in FAO to produce this, this, these documents because they have to be agreed by all countries, and you, have to, you, know, you, you need the time to allow them to come on board. But thank you for the question. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. That's it. Um, I, I just want to ask a technical question of one of your slides. Um, you, you showed a slide with landings, and you said it was a bit disturbing that you didn't have stability in, um, or weren't getting to st stability in the developing world. And um, I just wanted to, s uh, and I assume that's, because both seem to be kind of leveling off, both developing if on the average, but there's more of the variance around that, that average that's bouncing up and down. And I'm wondering if you think that's, most of those countries are tropical. Uh, it's a nat part of the nature of the biology of the species harvested, like the anchoveta and things like that, or is it, or do you think it's more fisheries management driven? Uh, it's not so much the variability that concerns us. I mean, variability is just a fact of, uh, as you say, things like the dynamics of, dynamics of individual species. The anchoveta, you go from nine, nine million tons one year to half a million the other, the other year. So th th that, that is certainly part of it. But what is, to me, more worrying is to see the effort, the line of effort growing in the developing world while it is declined and then stabilized in the developed world. It is that effort, because that effort is not sustainable. And if that effort results in lower catches over time, then I am particularly concerned that, yes, those tropical regions, particularly in Africa, where the population is going to grow fastest, they're going to have less fish to eat. So that's the worry, not so much the variability. Okay, then uh, I think we end this uh, section. And uh, again, I would just uh, like to thank on behalf of ISIS for a very interesting and uh, and also motivating uh, both presentation and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Messi. Thank you. Yeah, so now we close for coffee break and then uh, the session starts uh, after that. <laughs>